Well, thank you. I mean this with all my heart. I come back here and just feel so much better about myself. So thank you for clapping and cheering. And for those of you who don't know me, I was on staff here for five years with my family from 2010 to 2014. And I was forever changed by this place. I'm not the same person. So I am incredibly grateful for Dave Ferguson and John Ferguson and the leadership team taking a risk on me. I'm not famous. I'm Bollywood famous, a small group of Indians like me. <laughs> um, so they took a big risk and hired me uh, as the director of Missional Imagination. Who thinks that's a cool title? <laughs> that was my job, just throwing dreams and fairy dust around the place. <laughs> I loved it, I had the dream job, and uh, so many of you have come up and asked how my family is, and especially my son who had cancer, who's, who's just doing remarkably well in, um, in recovery and remission. He's six foot three now. <laughs> they said, they said the chemo would stun his growth, so we think he was going to be seven foot. So we're glad, because that's weird. Like, how do you get clothes and shoes? So, you know, unless you play in the NBA, maybe, you know. So really great to be back, really great to see you. I love this church, and uh, it's my second home, and so, so happy to be here. How many of you are truth tellers? Proudly, yep, I see something, I tell the truth, I'm a confronter, no problem. I, I'm a principle over people person, mostly. Put your hand up, be honest. If you're sitting next to one who hasn't put their hand, just poke them and like, I'm terrified of you. <laughs> who here is more like me, more generally more loving? <laughs> like love is kind of, don't like confrontation, right? You tend to be one or other. Jesus is the perfect mix of those two. I, about 15 years ago, I was traveling with a very famous author and speaker named Michael Frost. Michael, maybe some of you heard him or read one of his books. I mean, he is, he is Hollywood famous. I'm Bollywood, he's Hollywood. I was just going and carrying his suitcase. It was an honor to work with him and a guy called Alan Hirsch. They were the founders of an organization that I still chair called the Forge Mission Training Network. We were in New Zealand at the time giving workshops on missionary training and we were staying in a Maori, which is the Indigenous People of New Zealand's retreat. And this retreat house, they just have all the mattresses on the ground with no sheets on them. Who's already grossed out? <laughs> you don't know who slept on them. It was just all in one room with all these men who were snoring. And I've been brought up Greek. I'm Greek Egyptian if you can't tell from the one eyebrow. It's the giveaway. Like, oh, and I'm, the, I'm on the loving side. Who, give me a week if you're like me. You could stay at someone's house and be sleeping on pins and needles and I'd be like, oh, it was fantastic massage. Thank you, I loved it. <laughs> like, I, I would never complain, right? Who's like me? Well, Mike is more of a truth teller. So we're in this large parking lot and the guy who's running the retreat is like, how's the accommodation? Now, who knows straight away the, the feelers are like, oh, this is gonna be bad. And if there's people around, you can be like, excuse me, and you go talk to someone else, right? Let them have that terrible, awkward moment. But I couldn't move away because we're in the middle of this empty parking lot. So I just said, Jesus, you can come now. <laughs> just come right now. I'm married, I've had children, my life is good. Please take me to heaven. Because <laughs> who hates conflict like me? Anyone willing to be honest in church today? So Mike, who is a truth person, goes, it's awful. <laughs> and I was just like clicking my heels. <laughs> Whatever was going to work. Have you ever been in a room like that where someone talks truth? Have you ever been in a conversation like this where you just feel a little bit uncomfortable? There's this incredible story in the Bible about a dinner party. Where there's heaps of really important people. And there's this one person who's a wild card. They're not sure how they're going to act. And every eye is watching this person because they have a reputation of not playing by the rules. And right off the bat, they do something that kind of rattles the nerves of every person. You can see everyone shaking. Every person's wondering what they're gonna do next. You know that uncomfortable silence? A guy chimes in, he tries to kind of smooth things over. And, but this terrible dinner guest seems to ignore all the normalities of conversations. They're not just getting the hint. They begin to sort of tell these amazing stories that rattles everyone. 
I hope you can guess who it is. It's Jesus. He was a perfect combination, I think, of truth and love. I think it's easy to miss that when Jesus came to earth, he was not like anyone else who had come before. This perfect bringing together of absolute truth and absolute love. You know, he was a rabbi. So he could open the Torah at the temple and teach in the most amazing ways that people leaned in and felt that their lives were transformed. And in other ways, he was the most loving, accepting person that he spent time with sinners. And people thought, look at who he spends his time with. How can he call himself a rabbi? Jesus confounded people. He broke the rules. He was the most radical, beautiful person. And that's why I love him. And we're right in the middle of this series. We're unpacking our three C's. I'll say our because I still feel like it's home. Is that okay? Our three C's. We're talking about connect in the middle of celebrate, connect and contribute. And those three C's talk about how we, especially this one, connect, about how we relate to each other as the people of God. How we be a community of Christ followers that call ourselves church. And you know, the church is not this building. I mean, buildings don't change people's lives, but what happens in them can and does. You are the church. It's not this building. It's not this service time. It's how we live together. That's what a world out there is waiting to see. How much do we belong and love each other? And Jesus challenged them, many of the religious people, about what they saw as church or community, as relationships as they followed Yahweh's, as Hebrew Jewish people. And yet he gave a radical new vision of true community and how that is lived out. In the Gospel of Luke, he tells a story about a dinner party. And I just want to read it to you now. He says, A man once hosted a huge banquet and invited many guests when the time came. He sent his servants to tell the guests who had agreed to come, We're ready, come now. But then every single guest began to make excuses. One said, oh, I'm sorry. I just bought some land and I need to go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, so sorry. I just bought five pairs of oxen. I need to go and check them out. Who buys oxen unchecked? (laughs) Please excuse me, another said. I just got married, so I can't come. That's a fair enough excuse. So, (laughs) you know, you've got these people giving out these invitations. It's like... It's like getting front row tickets to the NBA finals and saying, sorry, I can't do it. I have to change the oil in my car. You get it? Like, it's a terrible excuse. And so you can imagine in this story, people are starting to think, wow, what is wrong here? He talks about this wealthy guy who invites these friends. I mean, it's a party of the year and they absolutely blow him off. You see, Jesus isn't just telling a story. He's talking into the souls of every person sitting there. This is what I love about Jesus. This is what I love about the Bible. It's a supernatural book. It still talks to us today. And so the question is, what do we learn? No one could have expected what he would say next. And so he goes and he says, go, the servant returned and reported their responses to his master. His master was angry and told the servants, go out quickly to the streets and the alleys around the town and bring the poor, the amputees, the blind and the cripples. This would have made everyone lean in. These people never made these lists. They never invited to these parties. There was no movies or restaurants. People would often gather around the house of the wealthy and listen in on the conversations And those that hung out at the edge were now invited to the center. This is the kingdom of God. This is what I love about the church, that we are invited as equals. The marginalizing, the hurting, everyone is welcomed to the table. The doors have been flung wide open. Everyone is invited. You know, locked doors are very interesting. Uh, if you ever watched the movie Chocolat, great movie with Johnny Depp, um, I only watched the first 20 minutes because it gets a bit rough at the, at the part the, later on in the movie. But if you watch the first 20 minutes, the, the kind of camera pans in to this little church in the middle of a French village and uh, the doors are shut. 
You kind of get the impression that's what the world thinks sometimes of Christians, that we shut doors. It's easy, right, in this story to be like, yeah, Jesus, those religious people, they're awful. Give it to them. They are so shut door kind of people. But sometimes it's really good to kind of go, what do I do to contribute to shutting doors? Sometimes we don't mean it. Sometimes we get comfortable, right? Like sometimes we talk to the same people, the same friends. And I think sometimes people believe this is an extroverted introverted thing like clearly I can talk underwater with marbles in my mouth I don't have a problem talking to anyone but I don't think it's about the number of people you talk to whether it's a hundred people for me and it literally is I'm interested in everyone's story or it's one person it's about whether you are present whether you have arms open like Jesus it's not about the number it's about the posture and I think It's easy to think that's not us, but I think all of us can grow like this. We look at God's heart for the marginalized, we have to ask this question, do I invite others to the table? You know, you think about the truth, we all could grow in this area. The Apostle Paul talks about this, about the word ecclesia. It's not a building, it's not a church service, it literally means a called out ones. We translate the word as church, but it's it's about those who who we're everyone, whatever shape, whatever size, whatever age, whatever stage, whatever colour of creed, we all live on mission together. I love this. You see this in the Gospels over and over and over again, where Jesus blows people's minds and talks about this un, uh, the, the upside down kingdom. You know, whether it's Jarius, whether it's a rich, wealthy person, or it's a woman with the issue of blood who's seen as the poorest person, over and over and over again, the Gospel is the great equaliser. I love that, that we are brothers and sisters. I am your Greek, Egyptian, Australian brother from another mother (laughs) with one eyebrow. I love you. I love you. Ian, I love you. You are a very attractive man. (laughs) That's not weird. Is this your wife? I finally get to meet you. How are you doing? That's not awkward at all. We're family. Are we family? Are we family? This is just one big family, right? And it can't, I I often say to my church, you know, I don't just want to be a friendly church. I want people to make friendships that last a lifetime, right? Friends know everything about you. You know, have you ever hosted people and you go, oh, I'm going to put on the clothes that feel uncomfortable and make sure the house is perfect? Anyone give me a wink? But isn't it nice when you can have people come and you're wearing sweatpants and you haven't done your face. I can't do anything with this face. I have no hair now. (laughs) But you know what I mean? That is real family. When we love each other, we don't have to put on pretenses. We don't have to be someone we're not. That is what the church is meant to be in all its beauty and glory, that we would love one another. Paul often talks about this terminology as family. One biblical scholar says the comparison of Christian community with a family must be regarded as the most significant metaphorical use of all. Family. For some of us, that's hard because we come from broken families. But let me tell you, the, the people of God, it is the greatest family in the universe. Paul describes the church family as connected by agape, that is unconditional love. Let's read together 1 Corinthians. I'll read it out loud. And just, just in your mind, every time you see the word love, replace it with God in your mind and just think about, see, God is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. I have an 18-year-old now who just got a girlfriend. Just between you and I, don't tell him. I'm completely freaking out. Every time they kiss, I, I make loud noises. What? <laughs> Don't do that. Da- he keeps telling me, Dad, you're freaking her out. You're being so weird. I really like her. She's a sweet girl. But I don't like my baby boy making out with another person. It's so weird. I am a complete weirdo. Every room I walk in, Aah! stop that. 
It's really good to stop that stuff happening, but they'll probably do it somewhere else. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm learning to be unconditional and love her. She's, a, she's beautiful. She loves God. She's really good for Him. But it's my stuff. And he's like, I'm, I'm realizing, like he's 18. He's like, wow, Dad, you have a lot of issues. I'm like, tell me about it. <laughs> he's worked out I'm not perfect anymore. My baby boy. But see, look, God is perfect. His love is perfect. There are not no strings attached. There is no condition. Love does not delight in evil or weird noises, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Let me tell you, we will fail each other, but God never fails us. And when He inhabits us and is with us, we get a chance to not, we will not, we will fail each other, Right? It takes two minutes. Give me a week if anyone's ever let you down. There's a lot of how you doings going on around the room, right? It's not that we will not fail each other. It's that God never fails us and He lets us restore one another. This is the greatest place to make mistakes. That we would love one another, support one another. I don't just think this is a wedding passage. I think there is something very special about sharing moments, sharing meals, and sharing life. My favorite word in the Bible is diatribo. It's the Greek word from John 3.22. It says, Jesus went from Jerusalem to Judea where he, the English word is spent time. Who knows relationships take time? Spent time. But the Greek word is so much more beautiful. It actually means for skin to rub through to skin. Isn't that beautiful? Replace the English word. Jesus went from Jerusalem to Judea where he spent time. Who he was rubbed through with them. The executive pastor here, his name is Doug Ledden. His wife is Mary. Mary and Doug are our dearest friends that come and visit us in Australia. You know, I just spend time with them and I feel like the best of them rubs off on me and maybe just a little bit of the Jesus in me will rub off on them. That's called shared life. I love their kids. I've watched their daughters. They have twins. Just these two beautiful girls just grow up and become young women. Their son, Bobby, it just, for me, this, it is not about staring at the, church is not about staring at the back of someone's head. If that is your church experience, then I am so sorry. It is about life on life. It's about skin on skin. Is that not a beautiful image? That is what a world out there is waiting to see. N.T. Wright says, the early Christians did their best to live as extended family, caring for each other in the way in which, in that world, extended families did. They called each other brother and sister. And they really meant it. They lived and prayed and thought like that. Children of the same father, following the same older brother, sharing goods and resources when needs arose. When they talked about love, That's the main thing they meant. Living as a single family and mutually supporting community. The church must never forget that calling. You know, um, my wife and I are leading a a site like this, uh, about a thousand people. And we started a life group. We, we, We noticed that singles, it's hard for singles in the church. People are weird. You know, we tell them they're teenagers, don't touch each other, don't touch each other, don't keep away, keep away, you're 18, get married, get married, what are you doing, you're a spig star? It's all this pressure. And then, that doesn't happen here, that's the church down the road, none of that ever happens here. <laughs> you know, if, you, so if you're in your late 20s, early 30s, late 30s, and you're single, sometimes it's very hard to fit, right? So we didn't start a singles group, no offence if you have single groups here, that's wonderful, but we didn't. We wanted to have a group where you, you just belong. We have a ton of these single men and women. And one particular girl joined our group. I won't say her name for confidentiality. But, you know, she she came out of an abusive, terrible relationship. She was beaten terribly. And we we really found her at our church post that breakup, just getting healed. She began to go to court for custody of her child. Just a young woman, just terribly, terribly abused. And our life group, we, we call small groups, life group, we call them life groups. We just loved her. And actually, I was interviewing her sister on stage about a month back. 
because uh, she got pregnant. It was a whole miracle kind of story. But I said, what has been the most impacting thing about being part of the church? She said, family. Now, they are um, from India. And uh, so she was telling the story that when they went to court for their sister, you know, all their families together. But then a lady from our life group who is not Indian, her name's Nicole. She's just kind of an Anglo-Australian. She would go along to every court case, every one of them. And you know, sometimes you have to wait for hours to get seen. And, but she would be there just praying and supporting. Another girl from our, another uh, leader from our church named Desiree, who heads up sort of our community 412 stuff, she would go every court case. And so when the lawyer came and said, is your family here? She said, they're all here. And you can see the lawyer. He's like, you don't, something is odd here. Like, <laughs> something is not like the other, right? Like, they're like, this is our family. They're like, okay. But that's what family feels like. Not just in theory, but actually when tough times come, we are there together, that shared life. I love that. I love that they have found each other. In her book, Disunity in Christ, social psychologist Christina Cleveland, she's amazing. You've got to read any of her stuff. I've met her. She's an incredible writer. She talks about the attributes that people need to feel included. Number one, it's identification. Identification is a sense that other people will be proud of your accomplishments or sadness by your failures, that they are there to identify with your experience. Now, when my son had cancer, you know, well-meaning Christians would say the most awkward thing sometimes. Um, Brene Brown, she writes a lot about this. I'd, I'd read any of her stuff. She's incredible. She talks about when someone, the difference between sympathy and empathy. You know, like you have a breakup, which is so sad, and you're talking to someone, and they say, well, at least you had a partner. <laughs> Who's ever had one of those said to you? <laughs> like, thanks, I feel so much better. <laughs> That's sympathy. That's projecting your stuff on others. But he talks about empathy is when you climb down into the hole and you sit with someone without judgment. Is that not what the church is? that we climb into the holes, we climb the valleys. When things are going well, we stand and we cheer each other on. When others go further and do better because they're our brothers and our sisters. And we climb into the holes when others are hurting and we don't lecture them, we don't sympathise, but we are Jesus' hands and feet. That is the best thing about the Kingdom of God. That's what she's talking about, identification. Romans, this is what Paul talks about. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Appreciation, I love this. Actually telling people you appreciate them, calling out the best in them. Around here, we call it the I see in you. I'm yet to meet someone who's like, no, 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 no. I have the best self-esteem. I'm totally full up. Thank you, no more compliments. <laughs> maybe, maybe Dave Ferguson. <laughs> but it, he's weird. The rest of us humans, we need a bit of love and affection. Who's with me? I come to America just to get filled up. Because Australia's a bunch of convicts. <laughs> They're super negative, right? So my wife's like, are you filled up, honey? Almost, babe, almost. Because it'll last me a year, a good year. I come here and you Americans, this is a gift you have, but it's got to be sincere, right? No one wants to know, you're amazing and you don't mean it, right? But when you look people in the eye and you say, I, man, I believe in you. I see in you. I mean, I look around this church and I could spend Hours just pointing people out and going, what a credible gift you are to the body. We can never do that enough to call out that we need people. Lastly, she says dependence. That means I'm counting on you. We don't want you just to stare at the back of someone's head and just see this as a performance. We want you to participate because we need you. God brought you here. You have unique gifts and skills. You may not be at the front. Many of it might be unseen in the background, but it's not about who's seen and who's unseen. It's about a team working together to be a family. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to serve here and see before the service. Every, we've been doing it since I was here at Community in 2010. We gather as a team and we go, you know, it's church time. We kind of yell out, it's a very American thing. I tried it back home and they all laughed at me. But we, we took the idea and made it Australian. But what I love, what we do, is we always recognise those that are seen and unseen, that we are a team, it's equal. I love it, I learned it from here. And we gather every Sunday morning, just like they do here. 
And we celebrate that all of our gifts are used. Look at me, every one of you in this room, in the balcony down the front, you have gifts that are needed. Next week, we're gonna have the opportunity to make a commitment to be a 3C Christ follower. And it's my prayer that you would embrace this radical life of Jesus, that you would take the online survey that will be now the 3C Spiritual Growth Plan. You can find it on the website. And I wanna encourage you, just as I finish, the DNA of the church is shared life. It's belonging. It's everyone welcome to the table. I want to encourage you, as I read this last bit of scripture, just still yourself for a moment. Forget what you're having for lunch. Forget the business of your life. How can you open more doors in your heart, in your community, at your table? How can you be the hands and feet of Jesus, introverted, extroverted? How can you continue to help people see that God loves them, no matter what they've done, no matter what they've become, that they have a place at the table, that the kingdom of God is the great equalizing place and space for family. Let me read this and then I'll pray. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the life together, the common meal and to prayers and everyone was in awe. That's the world, all those Wonders and signs done through the apostles and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony. They made incredible music together, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's needs was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals in the home and every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful and they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Who cannot like this irresistible faith we have? And every day their numbers grew as God added to those who were being saved. Can you close your eyes as I pray? Father, I thank you for this yellow box community, for this 11 o'clock service. May you bond them together as family. May the doors blow open, whatever colour, whatever socioeconomic background, whatever age, the single or married that we would truly be brothers and sisters because of what you've done in our life. May many, many people find their way back to God because of this congregation's choice to be like you. May we welcome everyone to the table. May we use our gifts. May we listen and be present. And may we honour you with everything we say and do. In this area of Naperville, and all the surrounding suburbs of Aurora and Plainfield, in Chicago, in America and across the globe. In Jesus' name I pray this, amen.